AC and Effers, uh, now in paperback, another paperback episode, uh, you know, shit's getting real over here in CNF Pod HQ, and yeah, sometimes you guys just gotta lean, I gotta ask the backlog, I'm like, hey, can I get a spot here, and Howard Bryant is here. This episode was originally episode 320, and it aired on June 10th, 2022, uh, that's the extent of my new introduction, Ed, there is an older parting shot about the book proposal process. It's uh, kind of fun to listen to, knowing where we are and where we've come from. So in any case, I'm going to get the hell out of the way and let this wonderful episode with Howard Bryant do some heavy lifting for us. Okay? All right. See you in Evers. Hey, before we get rocking and rolling today, I just want to say thanks for listening and thanks for taking a valuable hour to an hour plus out of your life each week, maybe more, maybe less, and spending it with this show. There's so much out there competing for our very finite attention. It's very zero sum. Listening to CNF Pod means you're not listening to or reading something else. So I just want to say for those who spend that time with this show and with the guests on the show we look to celebrate, uh, th- thank you. Thank you so much. Ideas don't sell books. Ideas don't make books. Ideas make textbooks. But characters make books. Stories make books. Oh, hey there, CNF efforts. This is the Creative Nonfiction Podcast, a show where I speak to badass people about the art and craft of telling true stories. I'm Brendan O'Mara. How's it going? Did you finish the thing? Did you start a new one? Did you start a new one at the expense of the thing you should be finishing? Speaking from experience, you'll soon have a pile of false starts and nothing to show for it except bald tires and an empty tank of gas. It's true. Howard Bryan is here. Holy cow. Holy cow. (laughs) I tell you, I've been such a fan of Howard's work for years. He's a longtime baseball writer and author. He was the guest editor of the 2017 edition of Best American Sports Writing. He's the author of The Last Hero, A A Life of Henry Aaron, The Heritage, Black Athletes, A Divided America, and the Politics of Patriotism, Full Dissidents, Notes from an Uneven Playing Field, and his most recent biography is Ricky, The Life and Legend of an American Original. It's published by Mariner Books, and that's Ricky Henderson, the all-time stolen base record holder, the leader in leadoff home runs. Fun fact... In my uh, beard eye playing days of college and post-college days, uh, if you led the game off with a plunk, we we named we called it a Ricky because you let off the game with a with a with a splash. Yeah, that that happened. Uh, anyway, like all of Howard's work, it's a it's a spectacular book and it's a fun book. One Howard desperately needed after writing heavy books like The Heritage and Full Dissidents. We'll soon get to Howard, but first a little housekeeping if you'll indulge me. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcast, and maybe consider leaving a kind review on Apple Podcasts so the wayward CNF or sailing the choppy waters of the podcast ocean might find our little podcast that could. Show notes to this episode and a billion others are at brendanomero.com. <laughs> there you can sign up for my Up to 11 Rage Against the Algorithm newsletter, where I give out reading recommendations, book raffles, writing prompts, and other cool stuff I stumble across that I think can help you get where you want to go and maybe even entertain you a little bit too. First of the month, no spam. So far, so far as I can tell, you can't beat it. And if you're feeling extra generous consider becoming a member. Patreon. Hey, patreon.com slash cnfpod, where I give out transcripts, coaching. I realize coughing up two bucks or four bucks a month is a lot to ask. That's money that you could be betting on the horses or getting coffee. Who doesn't like to bet on the horses? Okay, Howard Bryant. His website is howardbryantbooks.com. He's a two-time winner of the Casey Award for Best Baseball Book of the Year for his book Shut Out and The Last Hero. Uh, he's been a senior writer for ESPN since 2007 and is a sports correspondent for NPR's Weekend Edition. You're going to want to pay attention in class, kids, because Howard brings the heat. 
here on the art of writing biography, you know, building the world of biography, lobbying for access to these larger than life figures. It's all, it's amazing stuff. Some of the insecurities that we all stumble across as writers and, uh, and our mutual connection with the, the late great Dick Todd, who, uh, great book editor, Tracy Kidder's book editor, among others. Uh, so are you ready? Are you ready? Let's do this. What do you say, CNFers? Here's Howard Bryant. <laughs> would be, I think it was 2013. Maybe AWP was in Boston around there, and um, I was at a at a bar meeting a bunch of. Um, you know, Goucher College uh, Creative Nonfiction MFA people, and uh, and the great late uh, Dick Todd was there. No, and, my neighbor, my old neighbor. Yeah, yeah, and I, I saw you. You had come in, uh, come in the door to, to see Dick, and uh, I think I said I said hi to you in passing. Uh, but you you were there to see Dick, and uh, uh, he's just such a a tremendous uh, mind, and uh, he had just a gift for story, and certainly that, that gentle hand of editing and, and so, and so forth. So I was wondering, maybe you can speak about, uh, Dick Todd and your relationship to him and, and, uh, you know, just what you remember of him. Well, I think that when you're working on any type of project, especially, you know, the, the lonely trail of, of writing, um, you need people who are who are not only really gifted at what they do, but know how to talk to you as well. And and Dick Todd was uh, an old school classic editor who was very firm in the things that he knew to be true about writing and also was very committed as well to, uh, to the success of his writers, not only him placing his stamp on other people's work, but to really help you get to where you were trying to go to as, as a writer. And for me, Dick, Dick and my relationship was rooted 100% through Goucher College. Okay. Because one of my very, very best friends in the world, Lisa Davis, was part of the MFA program at, uh, at Goucher when I was at the Washington Post. And so I was living in Virginia. She was over by Baltimore, obviously, over where Goucher is. And... I was over there for her graduation, and that's where I met Dick Todd. And it so turned out, right at her graduation, I was on my way to moving to the town of Ashfield, of all places in the world, of Ashfield, <laughs> Massachusetts, that had all of 1,600 people. And he couldn't believe, you're moving where? Like nobody, no one on earth would point at Ashfield as a place that you would be moving to. And as it turns out, I ended up moving to Dick's hometown. So when I got there, there was already the red carpet was waiting to uh, to join that uh, lovely group of people, and they were so welcoming. And it was beginning of a friendship. I'm really sad that he's gone. Yeah, me too. I had the great uh, privilege of working with him in my fourth semester uh, at Goucher. So this is back in 2008 when I finished up, and you know, where I was working on a kind of a horse racing manuscript at the time. And he did have such a great eye for things and uh and uh yeah i think even tracy kidder who's sort of a, a, a sort of a regional neighbor of yours too in western massachusetts oh, tracy's down the street he used to come to our super bowl parties I love <laughs> amazing <Tracy. laughs> yeah thanks that, to dick <laughs> yeah of course and like i think tracy said like you know he always felt like dick was essentially even when he was in his 20s or early 30s just like was an old soul he's like he was born an old man <laughs> <And> yeah <laughs> had, had a very gentle demeanor and uh even an email he had wrote me one time, you know, as, as I was struggling to get some footing and traction with that manuscript I was working on, and I was just diligently like plotting away at it. He just wrote it like a short email to me. He's just like, you know, Brendan, I, I, I think you have, I, I think you have one of those things. Uh, it not necessarily, you know, talent or anything, but it's like you have. You can ju you just keep kind of keep gnawing at the bone. You keep going after it. And he's like, I think a lot of people who kind of make it in this, they they have the patience and the wherewithal to just endure. And uh, that's put a lot of fuel in my tank over the years. Eve. No, it's very important. It's really important, and it's and it's true. And there's there are very few of us who get tapped on the shoulder with ridiculous abilities to turn phrases and to to have a feel for the work and have a feel for words and all of these in any any profession. Even in with with Ricky, when you talk to, I think J.T. Snow has a quote in the book where he talks about how there's 
you know, what did he say? There's, there's 20%, no, uh, there's 10% of us who, you know, have to do everything the hard way um, with like zero ability. It's just all grind. There's 10% of us who are in Ricky's category where you're God given, you're just a genius at this and you can do things that none of us can ever do, no matter how much we practice and no matter how much we try. And then the other 80 is the rest of us. <laughs> and we're trying to get there. We're just trying to get enough breaks and to do enough and have enough ability to get there. And I think that's a pretty appropriate way to apply almost any profession. Some people are at genius level and you just look at them and you go, I can't do what you can do. And then, you know, most of us are somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And uh, the danger is so often the, those genius types are so revered, whether they be athletes or, or writers, that we, uh, us mortals, we we have a tendency to, uh, to our own detriment, like compare ourselves to them and hold ourselves to some sort of standard that is, is a, uh, is unreachable and sometimes that can really that can really be demoralizing so it's uh, i imagine too there are people that maybe in the writing writing world that that maybe you've tried to compare yourself to and maybe uh maybe to, to your own to your own detriment have you uh have you run into that issue of you know comparing yourself to people that might be like a little i don't know out, too far out of reach and it's just uh it kind of wounds comparing your myself to uh it's kind of the um it's the great line out of quiz show. Well, I never considered myself to have a level, but yeah, um, it happens all the time. You know, you, you know, I, I was talking to David Marinus this morning and I'm, I read, I'm reading his upcoming Jim Thorpe biography and I'm like, I can't do what you, you know, he's just too good. It's not that it's a competition per se, but yeah. you go, Oh, this is how you write a book or this is how you do it. And and that sounds sort of ridiculous in some ways because, I mean, I've written 10 of these now, so I think I have some idea of what I'm trying to do. But you keep trying to tell yourself, next book, I'm going to sound better. Next book, I'm going to write better sentences. Next book, I'm going to be more concise here and I'm going to be more expansive there. And you're trying to, you have to have respect for them because I'm sure David is thinking the same thing in his own work. And I'm thinking, I can't reach you. And he's thinking, mm -hmm. I can't reach where I want to reach. And so I think it's actually in some ways, instead of driving ourselves crazy about it, I think it's something to be applauded that you have enough respect for the work and you have enough respect for the material that you really, really want to push yourself to do it justice, that you really want to try to be good because the material demands that you be good. And that part of it to me is the, it's the agony of writing, but it's also the privilege of writing. You also want other people to read what you have to say. So you want it to be something presentable. Yeah. And then of course you read the greats and you go, I can't, <laughs> I can't get there. <laughs> and you just throw your hands up and let them round the bases. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you you know you wrote uh, well. You well, you just said how you know your hope with the with the next book you'll get like that much incrementally better, and you know you've got such a wonderful body of work. Um, over the course of your you know we can just keep with your book writing. What would you identify that you're you're much better at now than you were even like you know five books ago? Let alone you know right at the beginning. Well, I think the biggest thing that I always remind myself. And I learned it after my first book, after Shut Out, is ideas don't sell books. Ideas don't make books. Ideas make textbooks, but characters make books. Mm. Stories make books. Synthesizing makes books. The ability to connect dots and to tell the public, here's why this is important, while doing it through story and anecdote and through people in the way that makes people relate. Oh, I can relate to that. Otherwise they feel like they're just being spoken at like you're in a lecture hall. You can write a very dry academic book that has all the information and has all the goods and has all the details, but did you write the book you want to write? Probably not. I mean, unless you're an academic and I'm not. So for me, the very first thing that I learned in, in doing this 
as I was going into, you know, after the first book and after the second book was to still, was to constantly hone in on your details. And more than likely, and this is why Marinus is such a, 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 at genius level when he does this, he can take a story and give you the whole world. There are so many dots that you can connect, that you can relate to, and and then what happened, and then what happened, and then what happened, and you you get a feel for that universe, that ecosystem that this person exists in, and it will tell you so much more about the world, about that person. If you can explain the world that they live in, if you can explain why they are significant, it will make them much more readable it'll make the story much more readable. And I think in every book you are trying to explain, here's why you should read this. Here's why this is important. Here's why this is not just interesting, but here's why it's significant. And to me, that all just goes back to the research. The more you research, the more dots you, there are to connect. The less you research, the less dots you know exist. The less dots out there, the, you can't connect the dots because you didn't do the research to know that those dots were there. And so it really always does come down to knowledge of subject and how much are you willing or how much are you able to immerse yourself into that subject. And more than likely, there are, there are more connections than you'd think. Yeah, and I counted in the back of the galley, uh, the e-galley that I had for Ricky, and um, I might be off by a, a few, but I counted 127 interviews in the back. And uh, so that's a it's a tremendous amount of legwork for the research. That's just the interviewing. That's not even the reading that you do. And I'm just... actually upset about that. That's the piece of the book that I'm the most mad at. I don't think I spoke to nearly enough people because of the pandemic. My initial, uh... the hardest thing about Ricky is one, he played 25 years and two, he's young enough where most of his contemporaries are alive. You could have spoken to a thousand people. Right. And so that was really difficult to try to go out and find, you know, I need to find these people. And my initial plan when I first started to work on this book in 2018 was you could walk into a clubhouse and everybody would have a Ricky story. Somebody would overlap with Ricky somewhere, one of the coaches and even the players, because the, so many of these players now are the children of former big leaguers. And so, and Ricky is one of those mercurial human beings that just shows up in places. Hey, did I ever tell you the time Ricky Henderson? Showed up? What? He was where? Yeah. yeah very Forrest um, Gumpy and like that. Ex exactly. He's that guy. And so that was the thing that now that there's a pandemic, now there's no access. Now you can't walk into the clubhouse anymore. Okay. So how do we, what's the best way to proceed? Um, that was really, really challenging for me. And I had a choice because once again, if you had 10 years to write the book, you could have both. I had three years to write the book. So I didn't really have the amount of time to make to, to do both. And what I mean by both is you could really zero in on the research on the day by days. And once again, Ricky played, you know, you, so you're doing, you know, Ricky played from 79 to 2003 and that's just the big leagues. It doesn't include the minor leagues and it doesn't include when he was bouncing around the independent leagues. And up until 2006, 2007. Uh, so you could go through those day by days and go through all that newspaper and go through all that microfilm. Or you could also just spend a lot of time just trying to find every phone number in the book because you can't get a hold of people anymore. The last in-person interviews I did were in January of 2020. And so everything else was, okay, I got to dig in on the microfilm. I got to dig it on the day by day. And so you had to make a choice. And so the choice that I made was the inner circle people that I already had relationships with to really try to dig in and rely on them while spending every day in the microfilm. And when you're setting out to tell a the story of a person that is, you know, so, so much, so larger than life and has uh, just lived such an incredible, incredible life. It can be overwhelming to look at it, uh, you know, globally, like, oh my God, how do I get my head around this? So when you were set out to write this biography, you know, where, where what was your lead domino? Like, where do you start? Well, I think the first thing you do, at least for me, 
when I work on a, a book project is you have to have an idea. Why am I here? Right? You ask yourself the existential question and you're taking on when it's, when it's biography, especially you're looking at a person. I think of it the same way I did when I, when I did the Hank Aaron book, which was, I just envision a, a locomotive with a big old coal engine mm. and somebody there is shoveling all the coal into the engine to make it go. And for me, my first you know, metaphorical question is, what is that coal made of? Hmm. What is it that makes this person who they are? What is it that, what is that coal made of? And you start to think about, you know, can you find a place it, where you have a point of entry? Hmm. Is there some point of entry that will allow me to dig into this person's life? And, or if you have somebody contemporary that you remember, like Ricky, I saw Ricky play. And so it's not, it wasn't like Henry Aaron where he was born 30 years before I was. Ricky was born 10 years before I was. And so I remember the, and he played so long, I remember the bulk of his career. So you already had an entry point because you saw it. And for me, the, the arc that I began to create, and I think that that arc you shouldn't be so dogmatic about it. That arc has to change as you do the research. You do go into it with a premise. And for me, the premise for Ricky was, here's a guy that people talk about with that Forrest Gump sort of mentality. They talk about him, almost this combination between Satchel Paige and Yogi Berra, this larger than life American character where these stories can't be true where I, you know this all of this feels made up and then you want to interrogate that and so that was one of the first things for me was okay but when i was thinking about all of those stories and hey is the john olerud helmet story really true and is did ricky really frame a million dollar check without cashing it and you know was rick you know did ricky really get frostbite in July, you know, is it, are these stories really true? To me, I wanted to say, how did we get to this point with this man when in the eighties, when he was at his height, everybody hated him. He was one of the least popular players, one of the most gifted players, but people did not love Ricky and why, and then interrogate that. So now you've got an arc here. A story is beginning to form the first arc is you have a guy who was completely unpopular and then suddenly falls into the public's hearts. How did that happen? And then the other part was, why was he so unpopular? And what was that all about? And so you begin to create these different layers of this person. They begin to reveal themselves. And then you decide what of what is being revealed do you want to examine or make to make most prominent? And... And I understood in working on this book that this really is a, uh, it's the end of a trilogy for me, really, in sort of my my work on this, in that, although I didn't do the first part of the trilogy, it is the end of a trilogy. I'm, I'm on t the last two parts. The first part is the, you know, of the trilogy of American sports in the 20th century, which is essentially the first era is the immigrant era. And... You know, the immigrant era where you have this generation, the second generation of Americans coming in from Europe. And how do they become American? Through sports. The Jews and the Poles and the Italians and the Germans, those kids whose parents didn't speak English, who were their heroes? The Joe DiMaggio's of the world and the Lou Gehrig's and the and the Honus Wagner's. And 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 this is the the beginning of the sports century. And then the second era is the integration era where black people are now prominent and they are, they are now part of the culture. And how do they become part of the culture through sports, through Jackie Robinson and Joe Lewis and Jesse Owens. And, and now you have a, uh, a visual instead of black people always being in some subservient background, they're now in the foreground. And that began with sports. And then the third wave is the money. The third wave is the free agent era where the athlete becomes super rich, where they become the commodity, the free, the free agent era. And that's Ricky. That is the, 
that is the less heroic, less romantic, far more practical piece of this story, where now these players have their freedom, and now they are being able to be compensated and to cash in on their on their ability. And what does that do to the relationship with the public? And what is it? How do we treat them? And that's really where Ricky, that's that was the big piece of this book for me, which was we are now in that third wave. And we've been in this third wave, obviously, for the last half, you know, last 50 years almost, where it was fascinating to me doing the research that people were angrier with players in the early 1980s for wanting $700,000 than we are now that Mookie Betts makes $38 million. Yeah. But <laughs> but this is the start. And, and so you could have written this book on on Reggie Jackson, you could have written it on on Nolan Ryan, you could have done it on Ricky or Winfield or any or Magic John, any of those early guys who were at the beginning of the, this massive free agent era. You have to remember that by the time when Ricky first got into the big leagues in 1979, he was making 17,000. By 1982, he was making $535,000. And so the the this era is well underway and so much of the dislike that people had for players like him was how dare you guys make this much money? The anger, the anger was real. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I remember it just in the, you know, growing up kind of in the eighties and nineties and as the, uh, anytime, uh, you know, a big contract was signed or, or whatever. Uh, and, uh, I grew up in southeastern Massachusetts, so follow the Red Sox. And my dad was baseball. Where'd you grow up? A uh, little town of Lakeville, probably not so little. Oh, Lakeville, anymore. or by Middleborough? Yes, right next to Middleborough. Yeah. Went to a Pontiac High in, School. I grew up in Plymouth. Oh, very nice. Yeah, it. Uh, was uh, it? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I grew up there, just uh, next to a cranberry bog, and everything. my mother worked at Ocean Spray in Lakeville. Oh, no kidding! My mom yes, worked course. there the holiday season to make a little extra scratch for Christmas. And everything, nice, yeah, nice, nice. and yeah, and um, the cranberry economy, yeah, no kidding, yeah. And I used to go ice skating on that bog, uh, you know, the uh, Peter Beaton was there, and uh, yeah, and he was, you know, made you know, grew cranberries for uh, for Ocean Spray and everything. Oh, that's, that's awesome, yeah, oh, yes. it takes me back, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, but I remember my dad talking, I uh, just reading the Globe, and and he's like, whenever anyone signs a contract of the you know, of of this nature. He's like, not a single person ever thanks Kurt flood for, for the sacrifice he made to allow, to usher in the free agent era. And, uh, I, I, I in reading the heritage and, and reading this, I love, I'll, I love the grace notes when you bring in, you know, Kurt flood a bit and how he really made this possible for the modern athlete. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, and, and on top of that, in addition to, to Kurt flood, who, was one of the first guys to say, wait a minute, why don't I have the right to decide where I want to play? Yeah. You don't own me. And people hated him for it. And they thought he was ungrateful because you get to play a kid's game. It's not a kid's game. <laughs> this is a multi-billion dollar industry. And that's one of the things about this book that I really sort of enjoyed getting into was when you go back into the day by days and remember free agency was only 1975. So by the time Ricky gets into the league, free agency isn't even five years old. Baseball is a hundred and five years old, but free agency is less than five years old. And when you read the newspaper columnists, and you read the letters to the editor and the sporting news and, and you read the baseball, you know, you get involved back into the baseball universe. They honestly believe this was a, a game. This was not a sport. It was not a business. And they treated it as though it was not a business. And in, in numerous editorials, it's re reiterated over and over again that this is not a business. Even though you're being paid X amount of dollars, it's not a business. And so imagine the attitude of a Kurt Flood in that, yes, not only is it a business, but I have a say in this business. And the reaction to that after a hundred years of, of infantilizing these athletes. And because so many of us uh, fan, fans of the sport grew up playing it and know what it's like to play it, like our resentment just collectively, not like personally, but like the resentment can go to the player because we know what it's like to throw a ball, hit a ball, 
but we don't know what it's like to be a multi-billion uh, yeah, billionaire owner running this operation. And we're okay with them making hundreds of millions of dollars a year you know, and being worth billions. But, you know, we're okay with that, but we're, you know, pissed off that a player is making, relatively speaking, pennies compared to that, to that owner. So our resentment rains on, rains down on them. And Steinbrenner did a, did a good job of that, of, uh, of, uh, you know, denigrating Ricky in the eighties. Well, I mean, I think what it comes down to is we allow for, if you wear a suit, we expect you to have money. We don't question the money that you have. We assume that you've earned it, and we've assumed that that earning was legitimate. If you play, we assume that you're being given something. Mm. If you're black and you play, we expect you to be grateful for being given something. And we're going to get very, very angry if you take ownership and agency of your career. No, you can't do what I can do. And neither can anybody else around here. And that's why you're paying me all this money to do it. If you could do it, you'd be paying yourself. And if somebody else could be could do it, you'd be paying them. <laughs> and so that attitude really does infect. And it does, it, it informs the relationship, this adversarial relationship that, that people were having with the sport, fans were having with the sport that the sport was having with its own players. It's one of the reasons why baseball players and owners truly hate each other and have not gotten along for since the beginning of time. They, it really is. Baseball, no matter how you slice it, is a labor story. It's one of the most original labor stories in this country, even though people view it like it's just a game. It's real labor. And the reason why I say real labor is because these guys have power. Most of us don't have any power. You know, we, we, we hear, you know, even our unions don't have any power. Okay. They're going to try to, you know, slash our salaries 40%. The union's going to try to get it down to 30, but we're getting cut. Yeah. Those guys are like, we're not taking a pay cut at all. We're going to fight for things that, that nobody else gets because we have talent that nobody else has. And I think the thing with, with Ricky, especially in this, in this time period is he was completely unabashed about discussing this. Yeah. It was a huge piece of his personality. This country recognizes, respects, and worships money. Everywhere you go, it worships money. I worship money too. Give me mine. <laughs> not a heroic position, not a popular position at all. And, and also, I'm going to view myself based on money. I'm not going to give you that, ah, oh, shucks. Oh, it's just good to be here. I'm playing a kid's game. I would have played for free. Not Ricky. And this is the reason, as we were talking earlier, when you're starting to build this character, why people, this is why people didn't like him, because he's stealing the joy and the nostalgia and the willful ignorance that we as fans have always had, that isn't it enough that you get the girls? Isn't it enough that you can run like a god? Isn't it enough that you don't have to be in an office building every, every you know, five days a week? And how much is is enough? And yet it's a question that we never ask the people who actually own the game. How much is enough for them? So I sort of appreciated this as you go forward in the in the narrative of the of the book. It's one of the reasons why when when I was actually trying to work on books about this this era. A lot of publishers were really lukewarm about it because it's not necessarily heroic. It's not it's something, I mean, you know, fans want to feel good when they read a baseball book. They want to get excited about it and they want to get lost in the field of dreams and the green cathedrals of it all. Yeah. And here's Ricky saying, fuck you, pay me, right? right? To to quote our good, late, dearly departed Ray Liotta. Uh, Ray Liotta, um, that was Ricky. And so, but that's also a huge part of the arc of this book which is how does that guy that people couldn't stand because he, he embodied the greedy, selfish athlete of the 1980s, how does everybody universally love Ricky by the time he's 40 years old? 
Yeah, and speaking of you know Ark and then you know the world building that you were talking about earlier with uh you know David um, uh, Moranis's uh, uh, Jim Thorpe book, which I have a galley as well, and I'm looking forward to digging into that eventually. But that's neither here nor there. But he was you, know, you were bringing up about the world building he was uh, that he accomplishes, and um, similarly the world that you were building uh, with Ricky. I think you you really start the book with uh, you know the great mig- uh, the great migration of um, Southern African Americans to the northern cities and Ricky was among that from you know the you know southeastern conference territory and up to up to Oakland. So how important was it for you to set the context of Ricky going back to the great migration? Huge. It was the it, and it was so big that this was the original title of the book was Ricky Henderson and the Legend of Oakland. Mm. And the publisher didn't like the word Oakland in the title because they thought it was too regional. It was too limiting for the book. So the word Oakland got yanked. But the thesis of the the theme of the book really did start with this isn't coincidence. Like we talk about the effects of the Great Migration on so many things. But we don't talk about it in terms of sports. We talk about these places as if the players already got there. Like when we talk about Mobile, that you had Satchel Paige and Henry Aaron and Ozzie Smith and Willie McCovey and Double Duty Radcliffe. They were all from Mobile. Or if you go look at L.A., you had Daryl Strawberry and Eddie Murray and Eric Davis. And those guys were there. When you look at Oakland, everyone tells the Oakland story that Bill Russell and Veda Pinson and Frank Robinson were all in the same team. And it's true. And Dave Stewart and Ricky Henderson and all these guys are from Oakland. And I'm thinking... How'd they get there? So, so much of the of the story of American sports, especially of the of that integration era that we're talking about, begins with the migration. How did these guys end up there? And what I found fascinating about that was that so many of these players, they're all from the same place. Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas. Yeah. And and if we were talking about white athletes, we celebrate white athletes because we celebrate white America and we celebrate the roots of white America, especially when it comes to Ellis Island and immigration. Imagine if we had a ton, a generation of athletes who all became world-class and they all came from the same town in Ireland and came across and went through Ellis. That would be an amazing story that would be told over and over and over again. But the great migration for these black players, this was their Ellis Island. This was their, this is their immigration story to get away from the deep South, to go to a place to do better, to have better. And when you start digging in, you can't stop. When you look at Bill Russell and you see Bill Russell is from Monroe, Louisiana, and holy shit, so is Huey Newton, (laughs) right? And now they live two blocks from each other in West Oakland. And then the same thing is true that Joe Morgan is coming from Texas and then Bobby Seale and Frank Robinson are from, you know, just a few miles away from each other in Texas. And, you know, Ricky is from Pine Bluff and the Pointer Sisters are from Hope, Arkansas, and Lloyd Mosby's from Portland, Arkansas. And then all of a sudden, all these players are from relatively, you take a hundred mile radius or so in the deep south, put a ring around them, and they all end up in the same spot in Oakland. I mean, this, the, the Great Migration, Segregation, Immigration story is a huge piece of this, although it's not immigration because it's inside of the country. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that migration story is a huge piece of this. And in sports, we never talk about it. We just say, oh, my God, it's like something in the water. It's so remarkable that, oh, my goodness, it's a coincidence. How did that happen? How on earth did Bill Russell and Frank Robinson, how did they end up on the same team? Well, because the black people who came to Oakland were only allowed to live in one neighborhood and they all went to the same high school. So this is the story that I wanted to tell. And I wanted that to be really front and center. In fact, what ended up happening when we start talking about taking the pieces of the project and putting them together, it really was in a lot of ways at first two books. I'm like, this doesn't have to be a straight biography of Ricky. You could tell the story of this, just of this phenomenon. But then you realize that one guy does emerge from this group better than the rest of them, and it was Ricky. Yeah, and I think what's especially poignant about Ricky, and he came from Arkansas, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And uh, Pine so, yeah, and so when he when he gets to Oakland, he the I, I like how you're able to uh, unpack how insecure he felt about his southern accent, and how I he kind of he had to really you know, speak with his physicality just based on his intellect wasn't taken seriously, um, based on his athleticism. 
he didn't uh, he wasn't taken as seriously intellectually as he was based on say his accent and then his athleticism kind of you know, it kind of shielded him from from that so I, I kind of loved how you built in that insecurity that he had uh, as as a young person that that you know that kind of followed him through his professional career I thought that was just and he really was well insecure about his education that because Ricky yeah. had trouble reading Ricky was Ricky was completely secure when it came to math but not very secure when it came to English and grammar and spelling and the rest of it and really one of the more poignant things for me in the in the book was you know was Mike Norris telling me that he realized that Ricky really could not read very yeah. well if at all when he was as a teenager that that those kids had so much ability they had so much athletic ability that they really did get pushed through school. And then I asked Ricky and Ricky admitted it, that they pushed us through school, that when, whenever it was game day, it didn't matter if we had a test that day. It didn't matter if I was behind on my homework, it was go out there and, and play for the school. And, and that was something that is a story that we've heard really, you know, very often over the course when it comes to uh, African-Americans and, and sports. And so 100% if you you put some words in front of Ricky it he couldn't just wish it away with his talent the way he could everything else he was such a superior athlete he could do whatever he wanted on a ball field but this was one place he really couldn't hide and then as you get into the the his story into deeper into the book it, it does give you a different perspective or at least it gave me a different perspective of the Ricky story itself of all the apocryphal Ricky stories and all the anecdotes and making fun of them. And so are you laughing with him or are you laughing at him? And, and I had been forewarning people about the type of book that I had, that I felt like writing. I'd been saying over and over again, if you think you're getting 300 pages of really funny Ricky stories, you've come to the wrong place. That was not the intention of this book to just sit there and tell vignette after vignette of how funny ricky henderson was yeah that's a, a really complex yeah. guy oh for sure absolutely and it, that was one of the one of the notes i had made too about i, I think you might have written this in the acknowledgments or towards mm -hmm. the end it was um you know what could the writers possibly know about ricky writing down what someone says in worlds away is worlds away from understanding them and I get a sense like this book or any biography done well kind of gets out to the nuance and looks to kind of set the record straight for uh, on a personality, on the totality of their lives. And I guess if, if you had a goal in telling Ricky's story, you know, you know, maybe what was that? Yeah, well, it was the idea that of who gets to talk for you, mm. who gets to tell your story and. There are so many times when we talk about this, especially in post the post George Floyd America, where this is a big issue of who gets to speak for you and who gets to tell your story and, and what stories get told and how do they get told. And in Ricky's case, and in, in my case as a as a as a journalist, it's the sports I've always said this when I started my career back in nineteen ninety one that sports writers are like Supreme Court justices. They last forever. It's like a <laughs> lifetime job. Yeah. I mean, Bob Ryan was at the Globe for my entire lifetime until he retired a few years ago. And Dan Shaughnessy is still at the Globe. And, and Dano has been in that, been there since I was in what, the first grade? And so, and they, they're legends. I grew up reading them. And Peter Gammon started working at the Globe, I believe in 69, the year after I was born. And so they got me into the business and reading all these legends got me into the business, made me want to do this. But then you also realize that nobody who comes from where I come from got me into the business. And when you walk into, and when I got into the business, when I would walk into a clubhouse, the number of black players who were relieved to actually see somebody who may have a similar experience to them, yeah. try to describe them. And it's a real thing. It would be like, in another, in another sense, how would we feel as New Englanders if we were only described by people who were from Minnesota? They don't know how we are over here. None of them, in a very few, they might be sympathetic, but they really don't know how. You have to know a little bit more 
you've got to have that background. And I felt like, and I also felt like when I was doing the research, so it wasn't just me on a crusade. When you're doing the research, you see that the black writers, the few black writers that Ricky encountered, they viewed him very differently. The coverage of him was very, very different than the coverage of most of the of the white writers. And they weren't as obsessed with Ricky's quirks and his personality because, you know, they're... It, it, it wasn't necessarily that foreign or they got past it and didn't feel like it was disqualifying. And it's really, really, it's a really, really important point in a sport like baseball. That's not that important in a sport like football or basketball because baseball forces you to adapt to it. Basketball adapts to the people who play it. Basketball used to be a white Jewish game and then it was a white Jewish game. Then basketball became more of a black game and the game began to adjust to that. Then basketball became sort of a, a, a black urban game um, with the ABA merger. And so basketball sort of adapts to that. Now basketball can be sort of a hip hop game where you're watching you're watching a basketball game. They're playing music during the game. A guy's bringing the ball up court. You can hear music. Hmm. And so the sport adapts to the people who play it. Baseball still is a 19th century white pre-integration game. And if you flip a bat like they do in Korea or like they do in the Dominican, or, or if you play the speed game the way they did in the Negro Leagues, and somebody throws a baseball in your back. So it's really important to try and have a different perspective and understand some of these players on their terms, because that industry does not care about you on your terms. It wants you to adapt to how this game is played. The tradition of baseball is both the greatest thing about it and maybe the worst thing about it too. Yeah. And you're right. Uh, I, I like how you wrote a lot about the people who covered Ricky and, you know, specifically Claire Smith comes up a lot in the book and, you know, what was your experience you know, speaking with her about how she was covering, you know, getting get her chance to cover, cover Ricky in the eighties, especially and 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 dealing, uh, in getting, getting their insights from people who are really on the ground covering him. Yeah. So Claire was terrific in so many ways and her recollections and those insights. And, and one of the things that I wanted to do in this book was to make sure that I was focusing on people and trying to stay in the narrative, whereas you could go and spend an entire book going back and talking to people and, and to how they treated Ricky and what that time was like. I didn't want it to be that journalistically heavy a book. I didn't want it to be a reporter. He said, she said, and then here's how I feel about Ricky 25 years later because I feel like that changes the story dramatically because now when you think about Ricky's accomplishments, people are far less likely to criticize him and, and, and understand his time. So to me, it was really important to concentrate on what was said at that time. How is he, how is he interpreted at that time? And I didn't want to do a whole lot of retrospection on that. So Certainly, I could have done a lot more interviews going back and talking to people, but it just felt like more organic to say, here's what was said, and you're correcting a narrative. You really are sort of doing a, a course correction on a person when you're writing, depending on how you want to approach the book. And so the way that I wanted to approach it was, was to not have the record be corrected by the people who originally created the record. I wanted, it, I wanted what they said to stand on its own. I like to in this uh, in in this biography and the way you went about writing it. I could tell in a lot of moments where you know you really injected, you know your your voice and your writing style into this, which I thought was especially uh, kind of uh, just on the nose in a sense when you have a really uh, voicey central figure who's who's bigger than life. And it was uh, it was great to just the the little zingers that you you got in over the course like one like calling drafting and imprecise science was extremely kind to the baseball talent evaluators and insulting to the word science uh, you know Fenway Park you know calling it like a storage warehouse more than a storage warehouse than a ballpark which cracked me up <laughs> and then any the myriad times where you talk about the baseball's unwritten rules like lest the wrath of baseball gods be summoned for violating the unwritten rules according to the stone tablets of baseball's unwritten rules or all the written's in and uh all the voluminous byzantine unwritten's and uh it, it just it made me think of sometimes in in biography so maybe we get hung up on telling the story of 
the central figure. Um, but maybe there isn't as much room and uh, levity, uh, room for fun. And I could tell you were able to inject your voice into this. So like, just how important was that for you just over the course of the writing of this to kind of have a little fun with the, the story itself? Well, the goal was to have a lot of fun. Yeah. And that was the goal because my last two books have been depressing. They've been really hard. They've been hard on me. They've been hard subject wise. You're writing about, about players being blackballed for supporting black people. Not for kneeling, for supporting black people. Yeah. You are, and Gabe Kapler will attest to that these days in terms of uh, his statement or his stance yesterday, um, or do that again, or his stance when it comes to the uh, national anthem and gun violence. It'll be very interesting to watch what happens over the next several weeks and months there. This book is not about black kids being shot by unarmed I'm being, you know, unarmed black kids being shot by police. And that's really the narrative where we've been in terms of the work that I've been doing for the last five, six years. And so I wanted to take a step back and I wanted to have some fun. And I wanted to think about who I wanted to write about and who would give me the sort of professional palate cleanse that I needed. And who was going to carry a book in a way that I wanted to carry it. And I thought Ricky was as difficult a subject, but also as challenging and interesting a subject as well. So it became almost a, a, a it was never a perfect fit. Uh, that's for certain. But this was really the reason. It was, here's someone that you can have fun with. Here's somebody who is a unicorn and he doesn't, he doesn't exist anymore in terms of the way the game is played. There are so many different things you can jump off and and tell stories about when it comes to Ricky. You can tell the story of the the death of the stolen base. You can yeah. tell stories about once again when we talk about baseball forcing you to adapt to how it's played. And here comes a a, a made for TV superstar in a in a newspaper game. And you can tell all of these different stories. You can tell the story of money, which is one of the goals of this book. And so Ricky checked off a lot of boxes in terms of talking about this third wave, this third era. The, the other thing about this project that I really sort of enjoyed as well from the fun standpoint was the ability to just let it rip and just say certain things and write. It's not written necessarily the way a traditional biography is where you're writing paragraphs about what this man had for breakfast every single day. Mm -hmm. This was really more about Ricky in an era and about how he, how he lived in a time where the sport was essentially changing right in front of him. The biggest thing about Ricky though, that we haven't even discussed and we've been talking for 40 minutes is the thing that really made this story come together, which is this man absolutely obliterated the record book. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing that was the the piece of this whole thing is, hey, wouldn't it be fun to do a book on Ricky? And hey, you can cut loose and you're not writing about about race so much. And but you're now writing about one of the most underrated giants of the sport. And when we were talking about the arc earlier. One of the things that gave this story so much interest to me that I really was like, oh, this is something It was one of those gold coins that you find. You didn't go in, go in intending to find it. But there it was, was that. It was the analytics. It was the saber matricians. It was all those guys who rehabilitated Ricky as well. They were like, holy shit, look at these numbers. The numbers brought Ricky back. It wasn't the personality that brought Ricky back. It was the numbers. He was vindicated. This is a book of vindication mm -hmm. in a lot of ways that here's a guy that everybody was calling an underachiever because they were so focused on the optics of Ricky, of how he caught the ball with the snap catch and how brash he was in the base paths and how you know they thought he should hit 320 when he hit 318 or when he hit 290 and all the things that he wasn't. And then you look back and you go, oh my God, he's destroyed this sport. And it ran completely counter to every way he's been, he has been determined the way he's been described and how did that happen and because the numbers were so staggering even the people that didn't like him had to come around and that to me is a full circle story that is the when we talk about an arc 
he forced you to look at him differently. And and Bob Ryan, I quote Bob Ryan in there when he's talking about there's something about Ricky that, you know, is always a pain in the butt. And there's 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 Bill Madden of the Daily News talking about how why do you always feel like when you're watching Ricky, you're getting cheated? Look at what this guy did. Are you really gonna say he did not give you his money's worth? Did not give you your money's worth? And what I find fascinating about it is okay, now you gotta stop right there and you gotta say, okay, what's that all about? And it's, he really does represent enormous change in the sport. One, obviously, you're looking at the optics. Two, obviously, you're looking at his attitude. Ricky wasn't a friendly guy, necessarily. But the other thing was is that the sport changed around him. Back then, you know, when Ricky first came up and before that, outfielders were supposed to play 155 games a year. Ricky was playing 130 games. That made him a malinger. But now today, the Anaheim, the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim are giving Mike Trout load management to protect his body, which is the same stuff Ricky was saying back in the 80s. Yeah. So there is a vindication that comes with this project as well that I was really sort of happy to see uh, realized between two covers. Yeah, it's like based on his his preternatural <laughs> ability to get on base – and of course, steal base. There's like the Ricky run of him just getting on to getting first. He's just like steal second, steal third, scoring an infield grounder or sack fly. Rarely has there, when we like cast back, do we see someone's actual numbers overlaid to today's game? Be like he would be a monster today. Well, and that's the, exactly that. Right. That's the analytics piece of it. That's the changing universe piece of it. That's the concentrating on what you are instead of what you aren't piece of it. And the real piece of it is how damn good he was. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that I just love statistically about him, he outstole the Red Sox <laughs> right. during his career. He stole more bases during that same time period than the whole team. It's amazing. I mean, by the time yeah. he left the Red Sox in 02, he had stolen more bases than that franchise. Which is just a staggering thing to say. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just not something that you can comprehend. And it's amazing. And I think the, to to fix this, Ricky stole, by the time, I think by the time Ricky had gotten his 3,000th hit, I think it was 2001, that was the year, because then they got Johnny Damon, and then the Red Sox, you know, stole more. But I think it was from 79 to 01, the year before, Rick, when Ricky had joined the team. He had outstolen the Boston Red Sox. I can't even think of another. And I think the other piece of it, too, was the when we talk about obliterating the record book, name me another record. Name me another all time record, even Ruth's record, even Ruth's all time home run record, where you held on to an all time record as an active player for more than a decade. I mean, Ruth's record, you did it because the ball changed. And so there was that piece of it, and Ruth was ahead of the game in terms of, in terms of home run hitting. But Ricky broke the all-time record in 1991, and he was an active player until 2003. Yeah. I mean, there are very few records that an active player just keeps adding to. Right. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think, you know, who uh, other athletes are across other sports who might have that kind of – they broke a record basically – in their prime and then had the the coda of that career and then like you say just keep adding to it i i'm i'm blanking right now if there's there any. aren't that many if any yeah I, that's why they're called career records you break them at the end of your career you break them after you've had your career and then at the end you get close enough and now the record is yours ricky broke that record he was 32 years old <laughs> It's and on top of that, not only did he break the record when he was 32, but the gap between Ricky at number one at 1406 and Brock at 938, that gap itself is top 20 all time. So the numbers, yeah. so the point here is that the numbers brought him home. Yeah. The numbers made a new generation of people look at Ricky and go, oh, this guy was amazing. And 
this new generation, which now grew up in television. They grew up through television and they grew up through cable and they grew up, you know, through all the modern stuff. They weren't as offended by Ricky. So they weren't hung up on Ricky. They weren't hung up on the fact that he didn't defer to the grand, great old traditions of the game because these, this new generation of writer and of player, they didn't care about the great grand old traditions of the game. They cared about, Hey, I saw Ricky on, when I was a kid, I went to the Coliseum and saw Ricky, or I remember Ricky in the 89 world series, or I remember Ricky with the Yankees with the snap catch. And I remember all the things Ricky did. I went to a game and there was Ricky yelling at us, you know, going back and forth with us in the, you know, out in, in left field. So they were able to view him more holistically instead of being offended by this new presence who is disrupting the traditions and mores of the sport. I heard you say uh, when you're on the uh, Bryn Jonathan Butler's uh, podcast a couple years ago um, about uh, athletes and their how the big ones like a LeBron or Tom Brady uh, really controlling the narrative and how you know really bad that is uh, for journalism. It, it gives it's faux journalism when we see these things, but it's not real journalism because they're controlling the truth um, and. It got me thinking about this biography too, and how how you navigated the access you would need to not only to like speak to Ricky, but to tell a true story with not with his cooperation in terms of he's gonna have editorial control, but cooperation enough to give you the reins to tell the true story. So maybe you can speak to that dynamic and sure. how hard that is. Yeah, it's extremely difficult, and it is one of the most difficult things that you will do as a writer, which is how do you tell a story without access, without cooperation? It's I remember talking to the late, great David Halberstam about it when he was doing his Michael Jordan book, Playing for Keeps, and he said that Jordan had said that he was going to talk, and then Jordan never spoke. So he said, every time you make a phone call, you got to make five more. you got to make two more. you got to make three more. you got to do more research to fill in those holes. It's never going to be enough, obviously, and it's never going to be the equivalent of having this person tell you things specifically directly from, you know, write an original source from their mouths. Ricky spoke to me until he realized it was a real book. Then Ricky didn't want to talk anymore, so Ricky shut it down, and Ricky did the worst thing that you could possibly do to a writer. He told all of his people to shut it down as well. Ugh. And that's the one thing Henry Aaron didn't do. When Henry didn't want to talk, Henry didn't talk. But Henry never went to anybody and said, hey, there's a guy writing a book about me. Don't talk to him. Mm. He never did that piece of it. But Ricky did. Ricky, Ricky, some, some of Ricky's closest guys had agreed to call me, and then suddenly I never heard from him. They never called me back. There were some of Ricky's people who had given me interviews and then wouldn't do follow-up interviews because Ricky had shut the whole thing down. Ugh. And now you're yeah. you're up against it. Now you're like, okay, I have undertaken this project and I can't finish it. I don't have the access, I don't have the resources to finish it. How do I make this something more than just some regurgitated you know, compilation of newspaper stories? How do you do that? Well, I got saved by the bell because Ricky's wife Pamela made sure that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Anytime I needed an idea, she I called her. She called me back. We were on the phone for hours. She was the best source anyone could ever have. She's one and of the heroes the, of this book, too. She is the hero of this book. Um, yeah. She is tremendous. She was tremendous. And the reason why she was tremendous is because not just because she didn't want to see me fail. It was because she's truly committed to Ricky's greatness. As a man, as a person, as an athlete, all of it, you know, they met each other when they were in high school and she has been committed to him and his evolution for almost a half century. And she was the reason why I wrote this book in the first place. She came up to me during in 2014 when I was on stage with Henry Aaron and she said, I want you to do for my husband what you did for Henry. Ricky wasn't into it. Right. Ricky had no interest in this. <laughs> and if you'd left it to Ricky, Ricky, if, if you know, it would have never happened. Yeah. But I remember the point that I always make is the stories that we tell are not the most important stories. If we're lucky, they're the most important stories. The stories we tell are the ones that get repeated. And what I tried to appeal to Ricky was I tried to say, 
you haven't swung a bat in the major leagues since 2003. For somebody to have seen you, to have an, a first-person memory of you when you were at your very best, they had to have been born at the latest in the mid-70s. Which means they're almost 50 now. And these athletes like to believe that what they did is immortal. Everybody gets forgotten. Mm. The only people that don't get forgotten are the ones we keep telling the stories about, the ones we keep repeating. And the thing that I always like to say about this is somewhere on some subject, there were a couple of people in the seventh century talking to themselves going, nobody will ever forget this. And we have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> right. And the last thing I've got for you, Howard, is uh, when I uh, I like to end these podcasts by bring, bringing this airliner down for a landing by asking the guests for a recommendation of some kind for the listeners. And I, like I say, it can be anything from a kind of handcrafted coffee mug to a brand of tea to a fanny pack. It's uh, any, any your choice. So I wonder for you, I extend that to you, uh, Howard. You know, what 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 are you excited about that you would recommend to, to people out there? What am I excited about? Um, yeah. I'm excited about, I remain excited about a couple of things. The first thing I'm excited by is I still absolutely love Raul Peck's Exterminate All the Brutes on HBO. And if you can find it on HBO Max, look it up. It's an unbelievably inventive uh, doc series. Depressing as hell, but phenomenally made. And it's an amazing just story tell. Uh, it's great. It's great. I'm really ex I, I I keep talking about it. Because just from an artistic standpoint, what a vision. Th along those lines, not depressing as hell, but equally inventive and amazing and wild and mind-blowing, is Everything Everywhere All at Once. The uh, okay. movie I just saw just a couple of weeks ago with Michelle Yeoh. It's tremendous. Nice. It is absolutely tremendous. And then, of course... I'm reading the Jim Thorpe uh, biography, Path Lit by Lightning by David Marinus, which comes out, I believe, in the fall. And it is also great. I'm into a lot of things. Nice. As well you should, because a lot of those other things, whether it be movies or streaming, or it, it informs you know your main craft, I think. I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. to, it, I think it's nourishing. It puts, And then you can be like, oh, how can I, when I read this novel, like how can I maybe make my nonfiction kind of really pop like this novel you know, or something. I think it's very nourishing to have those different, a diversified artistic portfolio of interests. I'm also still very much into Powell's. Are they still doing uh, in person? I think so. I think, they're, I think they're doing in person now. I'm going to go call my publicist and beg to get into Powell's because I would love to go back there. I love that bookstore. Nice. And yeah, and if you, if you have an event uh, with this or a forthcoming book, I'll be sure to shoot up the five and shake your hand because it would be uh, wonderful to meet you in person. And uh, it be my pleasure. Thank you. Very nice. Well, Howard, I, I've been a great admirer of your work for so long, and it's been a, just a, a lot of fun and an honor to, to speak with you about craft and about this wonderful biography you've written. So th thanks for the time and thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Brendan. Be good. Oh, what did I tell you? How great was that? What a thrill to speak with Howard. The name of the book is Ricky, The Life and Legend of an American Original. It's published by Mariner Books. Get it for the baseball fan in your life, the Ricky fan in your life. I mean, what a life. That, that dude, that dude was amazing. Fun to watch. I remember growing up watching him, the, the green Mizuno batting gloves, uh, the leadoff home runs that we affectionately named our, our if you led the game off with a plunk and beard eye, you got a Ricky. Consider patreon.com slash cnfpod. And you can always head over to brendanomero.com for show notes and to sign up for the up to 11 rage against the algorithm newsletter. So I've been grinding on this book proposal. Still going. Chipping, chipping, chipping away. I got to finish it soon, though. Time is ticking. Time marches on. I don't know if I had mentioned that I got another round of edits back. Um, and there's quite a bit of heavy lifting to do. I've been chipping, like I said, chipping away at it. I think I'm closer to the end of this round of edits than the beginning, which is always encouraging. Uh, my agent has been wicked cool, and she's really sinking her teeth into it, so that's encouraging. It's getting there. I'm delving into a person who has been written about quite a bit, uh, who's dead, and 
I had one of the comp titles uh, sitting on my desk for upwards of a week. I think it's been more than a week. And I knew there would be stuff in there that would be essentially in direct competition to what I'm hoping to turn up, probably even richer stuff than I could ever turn up. And I've been putting off reading the book because the last thing I want to do is be reading it and be like, fuck, that's an amazing detail, an amazing scene. And if, if I use that, then all I'm doing is regurgitating what's already been said, but in my voice, and that's just cheap. I, that's a cop out. And sure, you, you do this to some degree with all your research. You are doing that, but it's just like, ah, it just feels like, oh, someone did some heavy lifting and then I'm just taking some of that heavy lifting. I want to do heavy lifting and I want to find good stuff. And if he's already found some great stuff and, you know, the person's dead, then there's, only, there's a finite amount of stuff. So you need to find different sources. But it's hard and I've just been really uh, uh, afraid. Like, sure, you have to do this, like I said, but you, you want to find new ground, find new people, new anecdotes. And I've been scared to read this because... If it's as good and rich as I think it is, then what more can I add to the story? What can be said that hasn't already been said? That's the death knell if all you're doing is heating, heating up the meal in the microwave. Have you ever had this happen? Am I just a weirdo? Don't answer that. I get this trait from my mother. The, the, this, uh, if I turn and face the other way and ignore the problem, it'll just go away. Like If I don't, don't open this book and don't read it, then... Oh, that, uh, all that stuff in there, that's, it's not there. It doesn't exist. Okay, so when I was growing up, let's maybe say the cable bill came in the mail. Uh, this is something that would actually happen. It was de definitely symbolic of how lots of things would happen. Uh, but she might not open it for days and days. Uh, then let's just say on a Monday, she'd open the bill and put it in a nice pile. Then on Tuesday, she might shuffle it to the other side of the coffee table, maybe put her checkbook on top of it. Then on Wednesday, maybe she'd write the check. On Thursday, she might put the check in the, the invoice into the envelope and maybe put a stamp on it. And on Friday, finally, it might go out to the mailbox. Sometimes uh, sweeping piles of dirt in the house just to clean the house, there might just be, okay, sweep, 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 a little pile of dirt, and just leave the pile there for days. I got that. My sister got that. She's better at working through these things than I am. So you get the idea that things aren't, uh, things don't get completed. So what's, what's the lesson? Read the book you've been putting off reading, even if you're scared, if it's covering ground that you're afraid will be repetitive if you cover it too. Oh, and by the way, stay wild, CNFers. And if you can do, interview. See ya.